This video is sponsored by Fume. Economics is broadly broken into two disciplines, microeconomics and macroeconomics, where one focuses on the everyday and slightly more tangible actions of individuals and businesses, and the other studies the decisions of entire markets up to even a global scale. The problem with macroeconomics is that it's almost impossible to study. Economics is a social science and good economists should apply the scientific method to their studies, and that means controlling all of the variables in their experiments apart from the one they want to change and the one they want to measure. Controlling variables is hard enough to do in a perfectly sterile laboratory on small scale experiments involving known factors. As soon as we consider that economics is a social science that studies people with all of their weirdness that comes from it, it makes controlling variables a lot harder, not only because of the subjects themselves, but also the researchers. Last month, the field of behavioural economics, a type of microeconomics that attempts to control for the inherent weirdness in human behaviour, was thrown into disarray when it was revealed that one of the most prominent social scientists was completely falsifying data to create outcomes that basically just sounded cool. The reason that this took so long to discover is that naturally people are different, and it's hard to replicate social experiments even on a microeconomic level. Then, on the scale of macroeconomics, it's just impossible. The world is home to 8 billion people that live in hundreds of countries, speak dozens of languages, work in millions of different roles, and have an almost infinite amount of different preferences. That's great to make the world a diverse and vibrant place, but it makes figuring out good economic practices from bad extremely difficult. Because, well, nobody's going to let economists run experiments on their entire country just to see how something plays out. This is a fundamental limitation that drastically impacts the quality of life of every single person on this planet. That might sound extreme, but a good understanding of economics, or the way that people interact with things of value, has gone hand in hand with modern technology to create the world as it exists today, where more wealth has been created in the last five decades than all of the rest of human history combined. We wouldn't have this technology without the modern markets to put it to good use, or incentivize its creation in the first place. So it can't be understated just how important economic improvements can be, but they can also do a lot of damage. Scientists experimenting with new compounds could create something amazing or something terrible. The chemical compounds for fertiliser and dynamite are surprisingly similar, yet one has fed millions and one has killed millions, but at least we had the benefit of realising that in a lab. Testing new economic ideas or enacting economic policies has the potential to destroy countries, and as in many cases throughout history, lead to the death of millions of people. So since macroeconomists can't conduct their experiments in labs, they need to do the next best thing and learn what they can from the successes and failures of real economies that did things slightly differently for drastically different outcomes. North and South Korea, East and West Germany, China and Taiwan, and even countries like Venezuela and Norway all have, or had in one way or another, deep underlying economic similarities, but ended up looking entirely different because of economic decisions made over the course of their history. So. What can economists learn from these sets of diverging economic twins? Where has this technique been used to make real world policy suggestions? And finally, what are the dangers of drawing conclusions from these comparisons? Thanks to the sponsor of this video, Fume. Fume is a great way to replace your bad habits in a healthy way. I wasn't sure what it would be like when I first tried these, but it was a lot more flavourful than I expected, and it's fun to fidget with for a distractible person like myself. They're made with all natural plant ingredients, and you can breathe in the pleasant and chemical free aroma and give yourself a distraction from other bad habits. And instead of vapour, Fume uses flavoured air with a delicious plant core. Some of their new flavours that just came out are orange vanilla, raspberry lemon, and sparkling grapefruit. Your Fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial, and it's designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de stressing and reducing anxiety while breaking your habit. I know a lot of people put off stopping because it's hard. But using Fume instead is helping hundreds of thousands of people to stop and replace their bad habit with something fun. So break up with your destructive habits and go a healthier way at tryfume.com ee and use code ee to save an additional 10% off your order. Of all the comparisons people want to make between different economic policies, there's perhaps none more obvious than capitalist free markets versus centrally planned communists or socialist nations. Of course, the small disclaimer here is that no country truly exists or has ever existed at either end of these economic extremes. Even very laissez-faire nations like the USA have an extensive list of laws and authorities governing how the exchange of goods and services can be conducted. These same economies also have taxes, tariffs and subsidies that subvert the free market to give an unfair advantage to one group or industry over another. 
even markets without a central authority, like the almost completely anarchical markets for investment into pirate raids that developed in Somalia in the early 2010s, had rules and customs that developed for keeping them functioning. So no markets are really as free as economists plot out on their diagrams. Likewise, even economies with an extreme focus on central planning and state managed industry have certain markets that exist, either with the blessing of the government or in spite of it. Beyond that, it's also important to recognise that political labels these days don't necessarily have a strong correlation with economic policies. The People's Republic of China, governed by the Chinese Communist Party, has more open markets, less readily enforced regulation and less protections than a lot of Western countries that pride themselves on their free markets. So with that out of the way, it is still possible to use economic twins to assess the performance of economies managed using these two systems. The most obvious examples are North and South Korea and East and West Germany. Already this is looking like a pretty one-sided result in favour of free markets, and economists, policymakers, and even everyday voters understandably use these comparisons as the basis for completely dismissing these economic policies as something that has been tried and failed. South Korea's free markets and free enterprise has provided a quality of life to its citizens significantly better than North Korea. Today it has a GDP per capita between 20 and 30 times greater than the North. It achieved this despite having an arguably worse economic position when the two nations were separated along the 38th parallel. North Korean borders contain a far greater supply of natural resources and share a direct connection to their longest standing political and economic ally, China, as well as the USSR back when the country as we know it today was getting started. South Korea on the other hand was almost totally devoid of any easily extractable natural resources and it was completely isolated. Their closest geographic partner was the new government of Japan, but following the Japanese occupation of the Korean Peninsula, which had ended less than a decade before, they were not exactly great friends. Yet despite this head start, the differences today are undeniable, and the simplest explanation to this is that centrally planned communist economic policies of the government squandered the advantages of the North, and the free market systems of the South enabled the country to flourish into one of the most powerful economies in the world today. This isn't necessarily wrong, but when presented with such a clear real world case study, good economists should ask why this made such a big difference. Of course there's the standard explanation that in an economic system where everybody gets distributed resources regardless of their individual contributions, there's less incentive to innovate, put in effort, or take risks. That is certainly part of it, but a good look at the reality of these economic twins will reveal that there is more than just the profit motive to get people to contribute more in an economy. Both North Korea and East Germany have or had developed some impressive scientific and engineering accomplishments in their time. That's because their people were motivated by recognition, a more senior position in the government, or because they were just really interested in what they were doing. Well, and I guess in these particular cases there was also other motivating factors to make sure people did their jobs, and it must also be recognised that the achievements reached through these alternative means of motivation were not always in the best interest of the nations, their people, or humanity as a whole. It was actually that point that made Ludwig von Mises, one of the most influential economists of the last century, predict that the Soviet Union would fall apart just two years after the Russian Revolution. That was because one of the foundational advantages of a free market is that it's a system to decide what gets provided and what doesn't with the fundamentally limited resources an economy has available. Remember, the central economic problem is that we as humans have unlimited desires but only limited resources in which to fulfil those desires. So tough decisions have to be made about what to produce, how much to produce, and who to produce for. A free market or a centrally planned economy are nothing more than different strategies to attempt to answer these questions. A centrally planned economy still makes those decisions, but as the name might suggest, it's made by a central authority that will decide what gets made and what doesn't. In theory, this could work just as well as a free market, or in many ways even better. But that would be assuming that the institutions making these decisions about what to produce and what not to produce had an almost omniscient insight into what their economy valued. A modern supermarket has thousands of different items, and that's just one type of business. There are thousands of different businesses in modern free markets, which means that a theoretical centrally planned economy would need to make perfect decisions about millions of products to provide the same material quality of life to its citizens. This is basically an impossible task, which is why the selection of goods and services provided in a centrally planned economy is far less diverse and rarely provides the quantity to match demand. In a free market, this decision making process is outsourced to every market participant that basically uses their money to vote for what they want produced. This means that no one single institution has to decide what to produce, how much to produce, and who to produce for, for every single good or service in an economy. 
Of course, a major problem in countries like North Korea and East Germany was that not only was picking and choosing what the nation's industries would produce extremely difficult, it was also something that the people in power didn't care too much about getting just right. The focus of these economies has historically been misdirected towards industries that the people at the top thought were more important than they really were. The Soviet Union in particular had an extreme focus on heavy industry and products that could be produced in big factories. This fell in line with the central planners' ideologies of workers controlling the means of production, but it came at the expense of other, smaller industries that are highly valued in regular market economies. Beyond just mismanagement, there is of course the risk of plain old corruption. When an economy is centrally planned and the leaders making those plans are not beholden to their people, there is more of an incentive to invest into the industries that will improve their own quality of lives and work to keep them in power, even if it comes at the expense of regular economic participants. This does happen in free markets as well, but it's harder to control when people have a say through their own spending. So while there are obvious weaknesses to centrally planned economies, by looking at these economic twins that had similar starting conditions, it becomes a bit clearer what these specific weaknesses are. But it also highlights that free markets are not perfect either. Following the end of the Second World War, West Germany was not necessarily developing its economy on an even footing. Between 1948 and 1952, the US invested over 13.3 billion US dollars into Western Europe to rebuild its infrastructure and get their economies going again. This might not sound like a lot today in the age of COVID stimulus, but it was at the time the most intense foreign aid in history. The Soviets did assist East Germany as well, but it was not at the same scale. So if economists properly account for this, it's remarkable that for the first few decades after the divide, the already wealthier western regions of Germany didn't pull that much further ahead. The same thing could be seen in North and South Korea. Following the end of the Korean War, the US provided billions of dollars in assistance to South Korea in an effort to stop the spread of communism. Yet despite this, in the three decades following the war, the South, with its foreign investment and apparently superior economic system, struggled to pull ahead of the North. One clear advantage of centrally planned economies over market economies is the ability to make big decisive investments, which when they're going through the process of industrialising can be a big advantage. South Korean industry in the decades following the war was disjointed and far from globally competitive. Small businesses produced goods and services but they focused on outcompeting other businesses rather than growing the economy as a whole. The North on the other hand, while obviously far from ideal, was able to redirect resources towards nationwide industries like coal mining and heavy industry. When both nations were so underdeveloped, the problems of choosing what to produce to maximise economic efficiency was not as important as just producing something. Of course, long term those benefits caught up and the loss of trade partners in the USSR, global sanctions, famine and the misappropriation of resources to facilitate a dictatorial regime have meant that now any comparisons between these two economies is basically just a joke. But it does still highlight one last problem. South Korea, for all of its success, has shown other inherent weaknesses in the market system. The market system of free exchange does give some feedback on what goods and services are demanded, but it's difficult to tell ahead of time. This means that resources are often wasted on producing stuff that nobody really wants and eventually gets wasted. On the topic of wastage, the market system is also bad at dealing with negative externalities or outputs that have negative value. An example of something with negative value is trash from our homes or emissions from our industries. We as humans value the absence of these things but producers share the negative side effects with everyone while keeping the benefits to themselves. Unfortunately there's no way for an individual economic participant to make a transaction for better air quality. A centrally planned economy can, well, plan around these externalities because discretion can be used to weigh the value of communal goods that can't be transacted with market goods that can. Of course, this is why in the real world most advanced economies combine the best of both strategies to manage their economies. Most goods and services are supplied by the market. But there are interventions for things like negative externalities, security, defence and even stuff as simple as roads. Good economists shouldn't just dismiss something as a bad idea. They should take the lessons from historical case studies like these and see what worked well where and what can be applied to our own modern economies. Nowhere are these economic lessons as important as when a nation is going through rapid development. And to demonstrate that we need to look at an unlikely couple, Norway and Venezuela. Now on the surface this might seem like a slightly less obvious comparison than North and South Korea or East and West Germany, but these two countries on the opposite side of the world at least at one point had a lot in common. Venezuela and Norway are both extremely oil and natural gas rich countries. Both of them attempted to set up state owned oil companies in the 1970s and yet today one is arguably the most prosperous economy in the world 
and the other is one of the least. When an economy starts to export a lot of natural resources, it has two big challenges. The first is the natural resource curse, or Dutch disease as it's often called. Now we've explored this challenge in dozens of videos on the channel before, including quite a few recently, so as always I don't want to repeat too much here. But put simply, if a country starts exporting a lot of natural resources, it makes people working in that industry a lot of money and it drives up the price of country's currency and foreign exchange markets, making every other industry in the country less competitive because their exports become artificially more expensive and it becomes more expensive to hire workers or attract investment because people would rather go where the money is, which is in extracting natural resources. This also weakens the economy because it makes it highly dependent on just one industry and just one export with prices that fluctuate daily in international markets. The other challenge is making sure that the country benefits from those natural resource revenues. It sounds simple, but in a lot of cases, foreign natural resource companies set up operations and end up harvesting the country's wealth and sending a good portion of the proceeds back to their overseas investors. Even highly advanced and democratic countries fall for this trap. My own home here in Australia, for example, has continuously failed to implement policies to share the immense natural resource wealth of the nation with the people of the nation. So both Norway and Venezuela had the right idea when they set up their own state-owned oil companies in the 1970s. Statoil and PDVSA respectively. These could be effective tools to make a profit off oil revenues and return that revenue to the nation to fund government spending without the need to raise taxes. What's especially devastating given the current humanitarian crisis in Venezuela is that for the first few years PDVSA was internationally recognised as a very well run organisation, largely free from the usual problems of corruption and cronyism that's common in state resources. So what made the difference then? Well hopefully by now it's clear that even if it would make for a great video, there is rarely one independent factor that makes a difference this big. Broadly speaking, Norway focused on maintaining economic stability and turning what could have been rapid growth into sustained growth, whereas Venezuela, which was starting at a point where citizens were much poorer, wanted to rapidly increase living standards, which they did, but it came at the expense of economic and political stability. At its peak, Venezuela rivaled the per capita output of the United States at a time when it was even more economically dominant than it is today. But that success relied on directly taking revenues from oil and putting them into generous government spending programs. When oil prices crashed, so too did the living standards of the people, and they naturally blamed the government, leading to a series of shake-ups in leadership with each successive party wanting to make their supporters happy by providing generous spending funded by oil, which only furthered the mistakes of the people that came before them. Norway on the other hand was, in fairness, a wealthier country to begin with, and their people enjoyed a comfortable standard of living, albeit far from as comfortable as they are today. This meant that there was less of a pressure to use oil revenues to get people out of poverty or modernise the country. Revenues were and still are used to fund government spending just like in Venezuela, but the difference is that they're invested into a sovereign wealth fund first, basically an investment account for the entire country. This means that if oil prices are down in one year it doesn't really matter in Norway because they generate revenues from returns on their investments not how much they can get for their oil. The oil and gas was just what they used to get their sovereign wealth fund going in the first place. This almost acts like an economic shock absorber. Some years oil revenues will outpace spending and other years the country may need to dip into its savings, but the country won't be susceptible to rapid swings. This makes it more economically stable, which makes it politically stable, which makes it a more functional economy where people can confidently set up businesses and invest in industries within and outside of natural gas. Norway will once again have to learn its own lesson as the country has recently discovered massive reserves of phosphate, another valuable natural resource. Macroeconomics is a difficult study and even more difficult to conduct. Two seemingly similar economies making slightly different decisions can yield dramatically different results, which is why it's important for economists to look at those small changes and put aside preconceived biases and potentially even political pressure to make policies that will potentially pay off years after the economist is not even around. If you enjoyed this video, you'll love the one we made on the Dutch East India Company, the most influential multinational corporation to ever exist over on Epic Economics, which you should be able to click to on your screen now. Thanks for watching mate, bye.